Thanks, Jessica. Uh, and uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, taking the time this morning to join this webinar. Uh, there's one thing I can say about working in computer security, and that is that it's always been interesting. Uh, there's a constant stream of, of new developments that are happening that uh, um, you know, have an increasingly uh, significant impact on the world around us. And so, um, you know, certainly that uh, has been true over the past month um, uh, with uh, the discussion around uh, APT1. Uh, APT1, so um, uh, perhaps I should back up a little bit. Um, uh, APT is an is a acronym that is um, uh, you know, used to refer to um, advanced persistent threat. Advanced persistent threat is, is a term that, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people have different understandings about. Um, uh, if you really dig into uh, the historical archives on Google, um, what you'll see is, is that the first people who started using that word um, used it, advanced persistent threat. They used it to refer to um, uh, sophisticated uh, um, state-sponsored attackers uh, uh, um, who were um, interested in breaking into computer networks for strategic reasons. They had a long-term interest in collecting intelligence about uh, um, uh, you know, what people were talking about in these networks or, or what work they were doing or uh, uh, really work product and technology information. And, uh, the, the reality is that, that as, as um, uh, you know, these things tend to happen, uh, the broader the discussion has become about the subject of advanced persistent threat, the looser the definition has become. Uh, we've seen a lot of people, um, you know, pick up this term and either because they don't understand the underlying issues that it refers to or because they have uh, something else they want to talk about, they've, they've applied it in other contexts. Uh, and and um, y y I have a I, I don't know I, I this, to me this is sometimes frustrating because you because uh, you know the issue of sophisticated state sponsored attacks against computer networks is um, a, a significant and particular challenge uh, that requires uh, a certain thinking about how to approach the problem and and a lot of these other contexts that the word APT has been applied to broadly are are l less. Uh, uh, they are less. Um, they're they're not as. Uh, uh, um, they don't require the same sort of approach. And so when we start using the term advanced persistent threat to apply to a lot of different things, it really muddies the issue. Uh, however, um, the the folks at Mandiant, uh, which is Mandiant is an incident response organization. You hire them if your uh, uh, network has been breached, and they specialize in investigating uh, advanced persistent threat related uh, activity. And they're um, uh, they're pretty consistent in their use of the term. Uh, and APT1 is the moniker that they have assigned to a specific threat actor uh, within the APT milieu. There are a, lar there are a number of different uh, threat actors that have been identified that fit under the uh, sort of overall umbrella of, of, of uh, sophisticated state-sponsored threat actors that are trying to break into computer networks uh, around the world, and particularly in the United States. Uh, APT1 is, uh, is, a, is a very specific uh, uh, group uh, within that umbrella. Uh, there are other names for APT1. Uh, Semantic calls them the comment crew. Uh, they kind of gained that name because one of the ways that they were using uh, 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 to remotely control the malware that they were installing on people's computers is, is by uh, uh, breaking into legitimate websites and putting HTML comments in the HTML for those websites. And then their malware would go out and pull the uh, web page and, and pull the comment out and the comment and contained within it uh, um, encoded instructions for the malware. And so this uh, kind of activity was very difficult to differentiate from legitimate activity happening on your network. It looks just like a, a, a normal user accessing a legitimate website. And so it's very covert and difficult to identify. Uh, and, and so that's where that name comes from. Um, we've seen a lot of information disclosed publicly about this threat actor in the past month. Uh, Mandian issued a report about APT1, and, and uh, uh, they, um, they provided a lot of detail about this, this group and attributed the group to a particular unit of the uh, you know, Chinese military. Uh, and 
subsequent to their uh, disclosure of those details, a number of other organizations have disclosed uh, additional information. Uh, uh, the shadow server guys disclosed a, a blog post with a bunch of specific uh, indicators of compromise. Uh, Semantic uh, put out a, 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 a number of indicators that they had. Uh, uh, there is also a uh, joint information bulletin that was issued by U.S. CERT uh, that includes a number of indicators uh, that relate to this adversary. Um, and in fact, Landcope also uh, released uh, some additional indicators that were not included in some of those other disclosures. So there's a number of, of people who have published information about APT1. Um, Frankly, some of this information was being traded uh, quietly or in private circles uh, prior to uh, the end of February of this year. Uh, when um, when a sophisticated uh, attack like this is discovered, uh, you know, knowing the IP addresses uh, associated with the command and control or knowing the MD5 hashes of the malware can be used to attempt to identify uh, that attack activity happening on a network. And so sometimes this information is quietly shared um, in, 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 uh, in private information sharing circles. Uh, and, and the reason for the, pr the, the secrecy is that if the people operating these attacks know uh, that the defenders are aware of their of their addresses and are aware of how to detect their activity, then they're going to pivot. They'll change the, uh, the, the way that they're uh, compromising your network. They'll change the addresses that they're operating from. They'll change the malware that they're using uh, so that, uh, um, th that those indicators are no longer effective for detecting their activity. Uh, and so as a consequence of that, um, uh, you, you know, traditionally a lot of this stuff has been kept under wraps, and I, I think it's it's a, really a watershed event that all of this indicator information uh, has been published on the open internet. Uh, and and in fact, we've worked with a lot of organizations who who were targeted by this attacker who were not aware that they were targeted before this information became public. Uh, and so the fact that it is now public information is is uh, is very significant. Uh, so APT1 is is uh, is a group that has targeted organizations in a wide variety of different industries. Um, I think that that sometimes people think that state-sponsored uh, computer attack activity is is only. Um, uh, uh, something that, that government institutions need to worry about, but the reality is that it is something that affects a broad uh, number of, of organizations in, across multiple industries. And so, uh, and, and I think that this is one of the revelations that, that really I think was understood to many of us in computer security for a long time, but uh, um, uh, you, you know, many people in the, in the broader general public were unaware of uh, that, that in fact there, that, that, that in fact there is uh, state sponsored attack happen, attacks happening and that they do target a broad cross-section of industries. Uh, and so the fact that that has, the profile of that information has been raised within the general public's uh, level of awareness is important. Uh, so uh, these disclosures, as I said, included indicators of compromise. These are some examples. So on the uh, left side of the screen, you see a collection of MD5 hashes of malware uh, that um, the adversaries were using to infect computer systems. In the middle, you see a, a set of domain names that were associated with the command and control systems that were used to operate that malware. Uh, on the right, you see uh, some information about SSL certificates that were used in HTTPS uh, sessions that the malware was uh, establishing. Uh, and then on the lower uh, uh, right-hand corner, um, uh, th there is uh, some IP address information uh, that uh, um, uh, was associated with uh, uh, the, um, the uh, attack uh, activity in question. So uh, the IP address is associated with those, uh, with those domains. Uh, these are links to uh, a couple of the uh, public disclosures of, of information uh, that occurred um, so when, uh, when, when Landcope started seeing some of this information getting disclosed by some of these organizations, Manny and Semantic, et cetera, um, the first thing that we wanted to do is figure out if we had any additional information that hadn't been disclosed. I, as I said, some of this information was being kept uh, uh, under wraps because there was an interest in, in uh, um, not uh, enabling the adversary to know that, that people were aware of how they were uh, performing their, their command and control. Uh, but now that this information was coming to light, it's inevitable 
possible that the uh, adversary is going to pivot, they're going to move. And so it makes sense for all of this information to come out publicly. Uh, LaneCope has a large collection of malware that we maintain here uh, um, that, that we use for uh, dr driving things like our, our threat feed. Uh, and we took a look through that malware collection uh, for some of the indicators of compromise that had been disclosed by other people, such as Mandiant and Symantec. We wanted to see if we had any malware samples uh, that were communicating with the same command and control systems, uh, or if we knew of um, uh, um, other command and control systems uh, that the same malware samples uh, reached out to. Um, another important point for us is to get the IP addresses associated with these command and control systems. Um, Obviously, when this information was publicly disclosed, a lot of the domain names um, at the moment it was disclosed may have been pointing at uh, a command and control infrastructure, but those domain names were quickly changed uh, to point to generic uh, IP addresses associated with common public services. Uh, the attackers did not want to reveal the IP addresses that they had been operating from. Uh, and in fact, when we when we collect these malware samples at, at Landcope, we uh, um, we um, we check the uh, uh, the command and control uh, infrastructure associated with them at the point that they're collected. And so that gives us uh, the IP address at some point in the past when the command and control system was still operational. And by looking at that historical information, we were able to identify a few IP addresses that uh, had not been publicly disclosed and that you couldn't easily find by doing uh, an NS lookup on the domain names that had been disclosed. So we published all of that information on our blog, and this, this screen you're looking at right now is, is that blog post uh, that was published uh, by John Pierce uh, earlier this month. Uh, the, these are the specific indicators of compromise that we discovered, a collection of MD5 hashes that hadn't been disclosed, as well as some new IP addresses and new domain names. And again, I, I want to emphasize that you know, there are some people who are aware of at least some of this information uh, um, prior to our disclosure of it because they had been shared this information through some sort of private information sharing channel. Uh, I think what's really important is that this information had not been published on the open Internet uh, prior to uh, our, our publication of it. And, and again, we've worked with a number of organizations that were compromised by this adversary that were not aware that their network had been compromised prior to uh, the, uh, the disclosure of this information by all these organizations on the open internet. And furthermore, we've also worked with organizations that had some of this, some of these indicators as a consequence of some uh, private information circles that they had been engaged in, uh, but they didn't have others. They had part of the picture, but not the whole picture. Uh, so again, I think that getting the whole picture uh, out to everyone who might be affected uh, is an appropriate thing to do at this time. And we were, uh, we were glad that we were able to help uh, provide some of that indicator information. Uh, it, it, as I said, getting the IP addresses was really important to us. So we took the IP addresses that have been disclosed by uh, some of the other uh, organizations, uh, with the exception of the U.S. CERT uh, JIB, uh, because that um, information is not supposed to be openly published on the Internet. Uh, and we, uh, we included the new IP address information that we had found. Uh, and uh, we, we published this file, which we're maintaining on our website, which is this new web IP list.txt file, uh, which has um, the IP addresses that we know to have been associated with uh, command and control operated by this adversary in the past. Uh, some of the IP addresses in this collection might be associated with legitimate services on the Internet. Uh, we've taken some uh, uh, effort to try to weed those out. Uh, we looked at where those IP addresses were pointing, and we've also applied these IP addresses to a few uh, large networks, and we've identified uh, IPs that, that get a ton of traffic because there's a whole lot of different things pointing to them. And we tried to weed those out, and, and we believe we've got the list whittled down to a point where um, th the, these are the real command and control hosts, uh, but uh, uh, you know there may be a few uh, uh, remaining uh, uh, needles in the haystack that we haven't identified that, that need to be weeded out. Uh, in any event, we took this list of IP addresses and we geolocated it uh, because it's interesting to see where these command and control systems are located, and, and they are largely in the United States, and so uh, and, and there are other systems all over the world. Um, the next most common location is Japan, followed by the United. United Kingdom. Uh, and I think the point um, here is that, uh, and, and for, for some reason, people uh, associate the location of the command and control system with the location of the, the attacker, and, and those things are not the same. Um, 
the the uh, uh, the, the fact is that that these guys will break into systems all over the internet, and then once they've broken into those systems, they'll use those systems to uh, launch attacks from, and they're likely to try to uh, launch attacks at you from systems in the in the same country that you're in, uh, um, from systems that seem uh, to be uh, not to not be suspicious to you uh, in an attempt to uh, remain under the radar and not stick out like a sore thumb. So, uh, you know, I, again, it's important to understand that these attacks may emanate from systems within the United States, even though the adversary in this case is almost certainly in China. Um, so as a consequence of all this information coming to light, uh, not just this indicator information, but also the, the, the fact that these attacks are coming from uh, China and the fact that they're uh, targeting a wide uh, array of different industries, uh, there have been uh, some uh, hearings in Congress, uh, uh, and in fact, last week there was a hearing by the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, uh, and the CISO of Mandiant spoke at that hearing, um, and his comments were really interesting, and he ended with this observation that I have here, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, he says, you, you know, uh, with respect to some of these indicators of compromise that I've been talking about so far in this presentation, he said, Every company in the United States that cares about security needs to be able to take a report like ours, digest the information in it, and look for intruders in your company. If you look at this report and you can't do that, you can't figure out how to find intruders in your company, then that's probably job one. You need to be able to do that. And secondly, you need to be able to see over time how this affects you. We find too many companies don't treat this information as a business process. They treat it as something that engineers and technicians need to deal with. You need to realize that dealing with intruders is a fact of life in the business world and it needs to be a continuous business process. Uh, so I, I really thought that this, uh, uh, this set of observations was, was very important uh, and I wanted to highlight it here. Uh, and I want to talk about um, you know, both of these uh, set of recommendations. The first is, you know, what do you do with all these indicators of compromise, all these MD5 hashes, all these IP addresses, all these domain names? Um, and, and it's important to realize that, as I said, because this information has been disclosed publicly, the attacker is almost certainly pivoted. They're not going to use these same domain names anymore. They're not going to use these same IP addresses anymore. And so you can put them in a firewall rule and block traffic to them all you want. Um, it's it's not going to do you any good in terms of identifying actual attack activity on your network. Um, you have to look at these IP, this IP address information historically. You've got to look at the logs that you have to see if systems that you had were reaching out to these systems in the past uh, when they were active. Uh, and uh, you know, at, at Landcope, we make a, a, a product called StealthWatch, which is a NetFlow a collection and analysis tool. Uh, and, and we, so, so the kind of log information you really want to look through is exactly the kind of log information that our product is designed to collect. Uh, um, and so Charles Herring is a, is, a, is a sales engineer here. He wrote this blog post uh, um, during, while this all was all going on, called, has APT1 been eating my porridge? Uh, and it's just a short sort of discussion about how StealthWatch can be used to look for these uh, indicators of compromise. Uh, NetFlow is is a protocol that that, that routers and switches speak, uh, which provides a transactional record of activity that happened on a on a computer network. Every single network transaction that happened on that computer network is recorded. Uh, and our product will collect these NetFlow records from routers and switches and um, will store them. We have customers that have a, a complete record of every network transaction that has occurred going back for years uh, because this NetFlow information is very easy to compress and you can store a great deal of it. And so that enables you to, uh, to really look back at using this indicator information and see if, if there's evidence of activity that may have been happening uh, uh, many, many months ago on your, on your network. So um, the uh, the um, and I'm I'm sorry this this uh, this slide is not uh, is not coming through the way that it it should be uh, there there was a, a picture that was originally attached to the slide um, but uh, uh, you, you know within our product. Uh, th there are a couple of different ways to uh, query for information related to uh, an IP address, um, and we have these uh, 
uh, flow traffic and top reports that can be used uh, um, that provide summary information associated with the activity to and from a particular IP. Uh, and we also have uh, a flow table uh, that can be used to show all of the individual network, uh, network flows associated with an address. Uh, and so our, our first recommendation is, is to look at the flow traffic and top reports uh, uh, before you look at the flow table, because the flow traffic and top reports uh, are, are, um, are, are resources that provide a, a higher level view of the activity instead of, uh, uh, you know, digging down into the individual network transactions. Oh, I see. So now it, it folds out when I press the next button. You can see uh, uh, um, this, this high level view here. I'm going to move to the next slide. Um, so. Uh, in, in this case, you can run a filter uh, in, a, in our product uh, with a particular time frame, uh, and you can input a, a list of IP addresses. Uh, so you can take that IP uh, address list that we have published uh, on, on the web, uh, which I mentioned in a previous slide in this presentation, and you can input those IP addresses into this filter. Um, in fact, this filter has a, a maximum number of IP addresses that it supports, and I believe the list that we published is larger than the maximum, so you, you may have to break it uh, into two pieces in order to perform this search. Uh, but you can input these IP addresses here, uh, and, and you can perform the search. Uh, and um, what you'll get back when you, when you get this flow traffic graph uh, is, is, a, is a chart of the activity uh, uh, that occurred uh, between these addresses over a long period of time. And this enables you to see uh, where particular spikes of activity occurred without having to weed through the individual network transactions. Uh, and you can actually click on one of these spikes and dig into the specific net flows that constitute the spike. Uh, and you can also look at other summary views of that spike, including the, uh, um, uh, the, the top clients uh, that were being communicated with at that time. So another way to, uh, to go through the information that in, in StealthWatch at a higher level than looking at the individual NetFlow re records is to look at an alarm history. So uh, our product is a network anomaly detection system, and it looks at behavior of hosts in the environment, um, and it, and it uh, profiles that behavior. And when a host engages in behavior that is anomalous or unusual, uh, we will fire alarms associated with that host. Uh, and of course, all of those alarms are stored in the archives in the, in the system as well. And it's possible to look at those alarms on a historical basis. Uh, um, you know, in this example, we're doing it over 30 days uh, to zero in on a particular time frame in, in which that host was behaving in a way that's anomalous. Uh, so, um, in, in this case, again, you can you can uh, search for uh, uh, you know a particular IP address, and you can see uh, its behavior over time, and you can zero in on a per period of time in which it was behaving in a way that's unusual. Uh, and that that can that can enable you to find the specific period of time when um, uh, when problematic behaviors were engaged in by that host, uh, so that you don't have to go fishing through every single network transaction that it engaged in on your network during the entire history uh, that you're looking at. So once you once you have have uh, identified that, it's possible to see the associated flows, so you can get down to those individual network transactions uh, at the point in time when you really are interested in seeing them. So in in addition to looking at this net flow information, uh, it's also uh, uh, um, you can also use our product to look for other indicators. Um, it, we have a product called a flow sensor uh, that can be used to collect and generate net flow, and the flow sensor. Uh, is is a um, uh, basically gives us some more context information about each network transaction. Uh, for HTTP transactions, the flow sensor will collect the URL that was accessed, and for HTTPS transactions, the flow sensor will collect uh, the, the SSL certificate information associated with the HTTPS transaction. And so it's possible to take uh, uh, the SSL certificate information that was disclosed by Mandiant uh, and and input it into a filter. Uh, and, and search uh, your, your, your NetFlow archives using StealthWatch to see if you ever engaged in an HTTPS transaction against the server that used that certificate. Uh, it's also possible to take the domain names uh, that have been published that are associated with uh, this activity and search uh, to see if you ever had an HTTPS or HTTP transaction that accessed a URL uh, uh, that included that domain. Uh, so it's um, 
uh, again, this is a this is a valuable way to go through the history of information that has been collected in in, in StealthWatch and find uh, uh, indicators that some system in, in in your network may have communicated with these uh, APT1 actors at some point in the past. So the next question is, uh, what, what do you do with that information? So you, you, you've, you've got uh, several years of, of NetFlow collected in StealthWatch. You've searched it uh, for some of the IP addresses or other indicators that we have, uh, and you've identified that, that a host was compromised. Um, and I, I think that this uh, situation is increasingly common where, um, and, and I, I'm trying to illustrate it a little bit with this chart here. Uh, um, there's some point in time when a host gets compromised, and then there's some point later in time when you identify that that host has been compromised, and then you've got to engage in some steps to remove that computer from the network. And this time frame that I'm showing in this chart is really ambitious. Uh, um, in this case, we're taking this host off the network in about seven minutes, which is very unlikely to happen in practice. Uh, in practice, most people have to go through a lot of political and business process controls in order to remove an infected host, and it could take 24 to 48 hours. And so the question is, uh, you know, what behaviors uh, did that host engage in between the time that it was infected and the time you discovered that it was infected and were able to pull it off the network? Uh, and, and it turns out that NetFlow is, is a really good way of investigating that uh, activity as well uh, because, um, you know, so a, lo a lot of uh, systems that you have that are collecting log information from your environment are likely collecting that information at the, at the border. For example, uh, you, you know, you may have your firewall set up to log every single network transaction that leaves your network and goes to the Internet. Uh, and so your firewall may be logging that information into a SIM perhaps, uh, and, uh, you know, you may be able to search uh, that SIM uh, for some of the IP addresses or other IOCs that have been disclosed around APT1 and find out if a computer in your network had previously connected to those addresses. But the question is, uh, you know, the firewall log is not going to tell you everything about what that host was doing on your network while it was infected uh, because the firewall can only see activity that's exiting your environment to the Internet. Uh, with NetFlow, you can collect records of network transactions at the leaf nodes of your network. So you can see uh, when that host was infected, not just what it sent to the Internet, uh, but w what it did to the other hosts in your environment. From a normal incident response perspective, this is valuable because it allows you to really scope your investigation. Uh, today, often people will take computers off the network and then they'll, they'll start a forensic in investigation of that computer in an attempt to find out why it was infected and what the uh, person who infected it was trying to do. Uh, but it's unusual that particularly a sophisticated threat actor is going to keep a record of everything that they did sitting on that computer for you to find when you perform your forensic analysis. Uh, and so, again, having these network transactional records for, um, uh, you know, what that computer did to other computers inside the local environment allows you to see where that, that attacker might have pivoted within your environment while they, were, while they were operating in there. And so you can find out what other computers you may need to pull off and, and, uh, and inspect and uh, possibly rebuild. Uh, and so the, the reality is that, that, that many people discover that they have been compromised by an APT threat actor months or years after uh, um, that compromise initially occurred. And so being able to go back months or years into these network transactional records and find out what happened uh, is, is, is necessary in order to uh, be able to completely um, uh, understand how the network has been compromised, what was compromised, and, and what it's going to take to actually clean that attacker out of the environment. And for that reason, I think NetFlow is an essential tool in, in dealing with, with uh, advanced threat actors. So, uh, you, you know, to begin with, uh, 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 the, uh, you know, companies need to be able to use these IOCs to be able to identify uh, breaches in their networks. And I think, uh, you know, NetFlow is potentially a, an invaluable ingredient in, in, uh, in, in, in engaging in that process. But the second part of, of uh, uh, the comments that the CISO of Mandiant made in the House last week, I think, uh, are also really important, and that is that, that incident response uh, needs to be considered an ongoing business process, uh, and that is a change in perspective, I think, from the way that a lot of people are dealing with computer security today. Uh, um, this chart is, is sort of an oversimplification, but it talks about uh, the, the way that people approach computer security from a vulnerability management perspective. Uh, their, their idea is, is that they, they want to keep the bad guys out uh, by patching holes. 
So they pen test their environment to find vulnerabilities. Uh, they go in and patch those vulnerabilities. Uh, and then, um, you know, they, they, uh, they maybe have an IPS system or something else that's there uh, because they can't patch as quickly as they need to. Uh, and if you keep up with all three of these things, you should be able to, to protect your environment against attacks that target known vulnerabilities that have been disclosed out there. The problem is that sophisticated adversaries like APT1 have the ability to target vulnerabilities that have not been disclosed and for which there is no patch. They have the ability to evade the protection that you have in place. They can evade secure, normal security solutions and they can infect um, uh, you know, hosts in spite of how well you are keeping up with this process. And so, unfortunately, when, when a lot of businesses, when, when they find that they have people uh, responding to incidents, when they find that computer systems have been compromised, the, the way that they um, think from a business process standpoint is that they need to invest more heavily in, in protection. They need higher walls. They need more pen testing. They need more vulnerability patching because they need to prevent those uh, incidents from occurring in the first place. And the fact is that um, you, you get to a point where you're seeing breaches that, that are effective no matter how much uh, you invest in vulnerability remediation. Uh, and so you've really got to consider a, a different approach. And I think that that approach is, is beginning to emerge, and it's an approach that, that centers on incident response. Uh, the, the reality is that um, Incident response, I think, is, is, is becoming more of a front line in how we identify uh, and, and prevent attacks from being effective in our environments. Uh, incident responders, uh, so, so you, you know, let's say we detect an attack. Uh, maybe we use some of the IOCs that were released for uh, APT1 in order to detect that attack. Uh, we, we identify that a computer was infected. We respond uh, and, uh, and take that computer off the network and we analyze it. By analyzing it, we will perhaps distill new intelligence uh, uh, a new uh, uh, command and control IP address, for example, or a new domain name or uh, some new piece of information uh, about how the attacker is currently targeting us. I mean, the fact is that if your organization was targeted by APT1 in the past, it's likely that APT1 is still interested in targeting, targeting you today. And so if you can identify those infections in the past, you've got to ask yourself, am I currently being infected? And if you find one of those current infections that's act actually active right now in your environment, chances are that, that the command and control system that is used and the malware that is used and the domain name that is used, these things are going to be different uh, from the information that has been publicly disclosed over the past month uh, uh, because this adversary is going to pivot. And so you've got this new information. You can use it to try to identify other infections in your environment. Uh, and and you, you can potentially use it to identify future infections. And so the information that you gain from analyzing these infections uh, becomes a part of how you detect them going forward. Uh, and in fact, it, uh, the, the reality is that in practice, um, the, the threat intelligence that you gain from investigating one breach that was successful uh, can often help you prevent future breaches from being successful because you know more about how the adversary is collecting intelligence and where they're going to come from and what they're going to target. Uh, and so this, this process, um, uh, through this process, really incident responders become uh, the, the, the centerpiece of your information security program. They become uh, the, 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 the team that's really preventing uh, future incidents from happening and disrupting incidents that are active in your environment. And I think that's a completely different way of, of thinking about computer security. Uh, it, it's a more uh, people-centric approach. Uh, and I think it is the direction that things are heading in. And I, I will likely do a more detailed podcast about that subject uh, in the future. Uh, um, and I have a few blog posts up on our blog about it. But, uh, you know, really, I, I think that, uh, um, you know, this is the most important change happening in computer